Welcome to Soul Night Live, episode number 65. Tonight, my guests are Pat and Deborah Mastelotto. Hi, Sean. Hey, Deborah. Good evening. Thank you both for dropping by. I've been enjoying the record, and I'm excited to kind of hear about the genesis of it and, um, you know, lots of cool stuff. So I thought, um, first, I was wondering, uh, just kind of give us a little bit of background on how you came in became inspired to uh, make an album that's kind of a kind of King Crimson for lovers kind of out record. You know, it's, you know, it's interesting because you don't usually put sexy and King Crimson in the same sentence, but between this album and, and Toya and Robert's weekly things, you're bringing sexy back to King Crimson. <laughs> right. Toya and Robert, they're superstars for what they've done with Sunday brunch. Yeah, those are amazing. I just I can't wait to see what they're gonna do next because every week it's a, a different adventure. Non crimson friends that have called me recently is going, is this is this the guy you know? <laughs> <laughs> they say yeah. the toy had like ten a million a million hits, two million hits, something like that. For her last I'm sh- you know, I'm sure it's because they were playing Metallica. I mean, what else could be the allure? Yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so tell me a bit about the uh, Romantics Guide to King Crimson. Um, the name kind of reminds me of the name of a, like the Young Person's Guide to King Crimson, kind of a kind of a, a take on that kind of thing, which is cool because it's, yeah. it's almost like you kind of know what you're going to get in advance in a way, but, but you don't because, you know, this album's something different. Truth in advertising. <laughs> so what do you mean by that this album is something different like how do you well it well it's not straight up renderings of cream crimson covers you know you guys have, have kind of thrown the rule book out the window and did your own thing with a lot of them and i think it's all the better for it because you know i mean we've already got the originals we don't need covers of that you know so yeah i think uh going in a totally different direction is great and am i right that a lot of the people that played on this were part of the three of a perfect pair summer camp right yeah it's not really a summer summer supper camp <laughs> you have supper we all eat together it's one of the best things about the camp is they have a gigantic pavilion tent so so you've got tables for about eight or twelve people set up all over so every day you go in for breakfast lunch or dinner it's like you can be lying over to sit next to tony or adrian or marcus or, or somebody else so it's a different you know mixes it up instead of just being it's not like it's not like a student relationship they're really great musicians a lot of them and most, uh, of, them. most of them and they've gone different places in their life you know so you know i kept doing it i couldn't do anything else but some of these people have other talents and they they've done other things so uh I took advantage of, of the team that I know up there. So uh, I think I already told you this when we started, uh, if I back up a little bit, this camp is with Adrian and Tony Levin and, and myself, and then Marcus joined us. Deborah's been up there every time, except for, did you miss one? You I missed, missed one. Yeah. But about five years ago, besides the jamming on prog tunes, uh, Tony and Pete Levin put together a jazz cafe. Oh, nice. Uh, I was somewhere else, but I'm walking across the lawn and a friend walks by and says, hey, your wife's got a great voice. Thinking, How did that guy ever hear my wife's voice? And a second and a third. So now I find out she was down in the cafe singing. Jazz is my thing. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was just she was in the audience. I don't really know. You you say, but uh, that was sort of. It was uh, Pete Levin and he was doing the most beautiful version of Summertime. And um I love that song. I remember my mother singing it at the kitchen sink at the top of her voice while she was doing dishes. I just have an emotional attachment to that song. And um, somebody, they were wrestling with who's going to sing it, who's going to sing it. And I just went, I will. I don't know why. And Pat told me, don't sing. I'd already told her the year (laughs) before I said she wanted to participate. And I said, no, we're really, we're kind of the hosts. And, you know, I, I didn't want her taking that. (laughs) <laughs> bit of the stage away from the campus and it wasn't it wasn't a stage so it was, <laughs> that's right yeah it was a cafe so it was perfectly safe but that was the beginning of the end because yeah. once that started happening then Pat was like then she started mm-hmm. to sing in public the following year a couple of the guys asked her to do a duet and different things so she actually rehearsed a little bit and maybe by the third year I'm not yeah, sure we did a song together um We have some of the campers that live around Dallas and Houston around Texas. So we hooked up with them and we rehearsed, which is actually how we started this romantic King Crimson record was back around December-ish. 
uh, we had some of the local Texas, maybe it was January, actually, about exactly a year ago now, just pre-COVID, we were having musicians over, uh, Mike McGarry and, and uh, R.O.E. Marty and Marty. Yeah, we were orig guy. originally we were tracking live with, uh, with Chris and Marty and Mike. And we took that for a few sessions and then we, we took some of that material and built on it a different way. And uh, it was just the search for how to present these songs. And then that eventually we invited uh, R. Lee, uh, Colin, and R. Lee Corin. DeRoe. Yeah. They came over for a weekend. So that was a very productive weekend. Uh, R. Lee plays the flutes and, uh, and, and her husband Colin plays oboe with the uh, Houston Symphony. So they're very wow. accomplished players, yeah. And their son is a fantastic bass player, a big, tall, lanky uh, kind of, I told you, the primus guy whose name I can't think of right now, Les Claypool. Yeah, yeah, very much. Um, so how did you go about deciding on the songs you wanted to use for this? Because you know, here, here's something I want to point out. And I said this to a few of my viewers in the past weeks as I was talking about the show. It's like, you know, you think of Kim Crimson, the first thing you think of are these really muscular, angular, dissonant pieces and yeah that's part of the picture but it isn't all of it you know i mean for every lark's tongue and aspect there is a, a cadence and cascade or a monte kudasai so and i think the best crimson albums have a, all of that you know you go you have the light and the shade maybe a little comedy too you know cat food or oyster soup or something like that you know so you know the the best albums i think have all of those things so you know, I think a lot of people just kind of hear about the more scronky tunes, but, you know, I think Crimson has some of the most beautiful ballads in all of progressive rock. That's what I thought. In fact, when I started researching it, I kept going to Pat saying, Pat, listen to this. This is, I would download the lyrics and they were so poignant and heartfelt and beautiful, some of them, especially if you flip the pronouns. Mm -hmm. and uh, instead of uh, a he, it was a she singing about her husband or boyfriend or lover being on the road all the time and what that life was like for her back home. All of a sudden, it resonated with me in a way that was very real. And that's mostly how we chose our songs. How do those lyrics work? Can I sing them in a way that feels real to me? And some of those songs are beautiful, but I couldn't make the lyrics work for me singing them. And so that's kind of how we decided on the ones that we decided on or because I, I um, they had to mean something, the lyrics. Although when we did Sleepless, my take on those lyrics is not what they were intended for, I don't think, because I had this idea that it feels like sometimes when you fall in love, it almost feels like you someone put a spell on you and that you're kind of going crazy. Like it doesn't feel real and you want back in your nice, you know, normal <laughs> apartment where you're not feeling crazy. And so in the whole, that whole idea of doing sleepless in a way where she's saying, don't worry, you're going to end up in your own bed. This is going to be, you're going to be okay. I know you feel like you're going crazy, but you're going to be okay. That was my take on sleepless. It is not, I'm sure Adrian's take on it, but he's a great songwriter. Too. I became really, really appreciative of Adrian Ballou as a songwriter, make, putting this album together. Oh, he's amazing. I think he's in the midst of working on a new solo record. So yeah. Yeah, fingers yeah. crossed he'll come chat with me when it's ready. I, he's oh, been at the it. top of my wish list since I started this show, but I don't think he's really ready to do any press yet. But fingers yeah, crossed. It'll, you know, it'll come yeah. around. Yeah, I mean, if I was in the middle of a record, I wouldn't want to be talking about it yet either. <laughs> you know, let's get it done yeah, first. It's finished, so you don't really want to talk about it until it's done. Sure, definitely. And it can change, you know. I know I've made a few records myself, and sometimes the adventure is recording it. and it The song grows and becomes so much more than what you expected it to be once you hit record, you know. It's surprising. Yes. And I like those moments. Sometimes things pop up just at the last minute, and it's like... Yeah. That made that song so much better and i never would have thought of this in advance you know so that's kind of i said it's kind of like painting you know it's kind of like painting a picture you know? painting. in fact when i first pat and i first started dating and i watched him work with pro tools i used to say that i said you realize that you act you treat this like a painting you start with your big brush and then you work down to the smallest little brush but you're working with musical notes in colors it was fascinating to me that whole process and maybe that's what ended up i mean pat and i've been together for 15 years 
this is the first time we've ever worked together. Mm-hmm. Like in an album, it was um, crazy, but it was fun. Really I bet fun. It was. I bet it was yeah. how, how did you two meet originally? I have I had had a big salon in downtown Austin, Texas, right on like a main drag. Big salon down on South Congress. What were twenty thirty foot? Ceiling. ceiling, big ceilings, huge walls. I had art she, openings. She'd put massive time. art all around so the painters around Austin could sell some of their work in there, you know, show it off. She'd rotate every month. And her daughter, Farah, uh, was introduced to me by Bill Munyon, who engineers on a lot of our records. So her daughter, Farah, had been cutting my hair for five or 10 years. And then after the divorce, I'm trying to, oh, I brought my daughter in. My daughter was uh, with, uh, a black, what would you, uh, goth, goth look. <laughs> and she decided right at, after the divorce, she, my daughter stayed with me and she said, I want to be blonde. <laughs> and so I called Farah and, and eventually Deborah and they said, you can't go black to blonde. No, no, no. So. So anyway, he started bringing her in really regularly, more regularly than he would have come in with his haircuts. And we did a lot of consultation. He played at my grand opening when my salon first opened. So We've known each other a long time. We just never really we never talked, really. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And then the kids, we, we uh, well, uh, the truth was I, I tried to invite her over and I didn't know. I'd never been on a date for 30 years. So I, I didn't know what to do. So uh, <laughs> we, totally we double true. dated with the kids. We went and saw Chick Korea with uh, Steve Gadd show. And then we went to see, uh, well, she called me up. Actually, you said you well, wanted first to audio you- slave. Oh yeah. <laughs> she wanted to see Audio Slave, but it was sold out. And and she said, Do you know anybody? And I know I, you've got to know somebody. And I did. So I made a phone call and got us in. Now when we got in, I had a ticket, but I didn't have a seat. And somehow she knew somebody else as soon as we got said, Hey, she's going, Hey, we got VIP. We're up here now. So So it was funny. We <laughs> looked at each other and we we're like, Oh, this is the start of a good relationship. He got us in, I got us VIP. The rest is history. And we it's saw Mars Volta the next week, and uh, uh, I can't. Well, think. you played for California Guitar. Yeah, that was Cal- all in that same couple of weeks, yeah. and um, then we just started being together. <laughs> always double dates, so always with the kids. Our first date without the kids was a festival that K two played in Moors, Germany, and uh, so I've been kind of dating Deb, sort of double dating with the kids for a couple months. I don't remember three or five. And I, I say, would you like to go to Europe? <laughs> <laughs> I said, sure, of course. And he said, no, I'm serious. And I said, you're serious. And he said, yeah, it's a cool gig. It's a beautiful festival. We're going to be in Amsterdam too. Five days. I know and, I'd have more fun if you came and, with me. And, but we're going to be sharing a room. So she knew. You did not say that. I didn't. <laughs> no, you said I could have my own room. I did. Okay. Yeah, that's how I you got lied. me. I lied. <laughs> I lied. <laughs> It was all good. It was really fun. It was very sweet. That whole trip was just And very to make sweet. it even better, Marcus was there. Uh, so, yeah, it all worked out great. It was a good week. Yeah. He came from the UK, too. Oh. So, it was Trey, Trey and Chemo and Philip are part of our, our original nesting of romance there. Yeah, yeah. So, I got a few people in the chat room um, that had a few things to say. Kevin Andrews says, Steve, please tell Deborah and Pat that Mark Haskett sends his love but can't post for some reason. Uh, I'm not sure what the deal is with Facebook. Sometimes I get that, and I, I want to say that, you know, it's a public chat, so anybody should be able to post, but I don't know. Maybe you need to friend me. I don't know. You're welcome to send me a friend request, Todd. I'll, I'll be glad to yeah, accept it right now if it helps. Well, okay. Kevin, here's the interesting thing about Kevin. Just as we're leaving the last camp, he turned to me, took my hand and said, Deborah, make a record. And I said, what? I've never made a record before. And he said, make a record. It's beautiful. It's so much fun. It's better than writing a book. Ke- Kevin is, uh, I, I, I don't know, we call Deb the camp counselor. So I can't give him that title, but he's been at every camp and he just takes care of business. He's an organized guy and he, he just, he, he rounds up the troops and helps us. I can't tell you how much he helps us. I mean, he's always, Pat, you haven't given me a schedule yet. I need to fill in these dates. And, you know, he's working all of us all the time, as well as, in case you don't know, he makes the funk fingers. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. absolutely. You know, he, we're, and we're he's all, a great bass player. He, he oh, played, he, elephant, he's played still, on elephant funk. Yeah, you know, um, I'll tell you how I met Kevin. You know, we're both here in Atlanta. 
And um, he's in Atlanta. Yeah. 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 And um, I guess back in 2013, I was looking for a new bass player for my band, which is kind of this instrumental thing that sounds like Steely oh. Dan if the singer <laughs> stayed home. You know, we sound like Steely Dan if the singer came, stayed home and uh, Rush's drummer dropped by to play with them. So it's a little, it's, it's a, a busier take, on, a busier take on funky instrumental stuff, I guess, a, from a prog rock mind set. Um, so anyhow, I had Kevin come out and try out for my band and I don't remember what happened exactly. I don't think, you know, you know, it wasn't that he wasn't wonderful. I think it was a scheduling thing or something that didn't work out, but I got to know him after that. And I started seeing him at, you know, every Crimson related show that I went to. And um, then I got to be friends with his brother because his brother is the best guy that works on amps in all of Atlanta, Andrew's amp lab. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's, and he builds them, he builds, builds his own as well. And they're amazing. I mean, beautiful boutique amps. So yeah, well, those. Yeah, Kevin's got a whole woodworking thing going. He makes the symbols <laughs> I use and other little, it, it's sort of half baked idea. I might have Kevin's a guy who hey, kind of was looking for something sort of like, blah, 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 blah. what, what, oh, I have an idea. He's made me little jingle toys and yeah, yeah. Tell me about the Simbo. You know, I, I, you know, at first I just thought that Tony was going to have all the fun, but uh, then Kevin kind of branched out into these more percussion um, well, the Simbo accessories. Thing just this, and I'll tell you, for me, it, it, I've seen it since maybe even in high school. But it was while we were making the Thrack record. Uh, there's a percussion ensemble, percussive ensemble called Nexus, and Nexus was doing a show. In, we were in Bath. We recorded at Real World and Bristol. I think they were Bristol University. And it was odd because, uh, well, Tony used to play with the Nexus guys. So he said, you want to go see Nexus? We went there. What I'm saying is odd about it. We went, just Tony and I, and we got there. It was almost empty. There's about 20 people in this recital room. And I turn around, it's Bruford. <laughs> <laughs> I look the other way and it's Evelyn Glenny. And it's like, wow, this is like, you know, there's David Rowe, it's lab. Everybody drove in for this performance, but those guys use the bows a lot on marimbas and, not marimba, sorry, on uh, vibes. And uh -huh. uh, that got me thinking, I want to get a bow. So I started to do the bow thing on cymbals and using a violin bow or a cello bow, they're too big, they break, they don't travel easy, they're expensive unless you buy the cheap ones and they break. So I was working in Istanbul in Turkey and I saw they have an instrument called a uh, Comanche. It's like a spike fiddle, a little one string violin kind of thing. They stick in the ground and they played it with this short bow, a little bigger than a drumstick with a big arc in it. And it just was really good for me because I could pull the tension. So I, I bought one and then within a year of touring, it broke. So it's all taped up with popsicle sticks. And I've been using it for like five or 10 years trying to get somebody to help me make a real one. And when I met Kevin, he took off with it. So he made several prototypes. He got better hair for the bow, made little adjustable tweaks on it. So, um, so we sell them as symbols through his, uh, it's, it's expanded hands is his website. Yeah. And he has several, he's got Tony's funk fingers and these other little oddities. Yeah. Very cool. And is there any particular size symbol that it works best on or does it work on all of them? It'll work on all of them, but like a China symbol. Mm -hmm. I mean, usually you want a bow, uh, I guess that's uh, vertically against the symbol. So huh. you get the friction on there. Uh, but some of the heavier lathed, uh, I don't know what you call it, like the black symbols Peisty makes, mm -hmm. uh, where they've got a little paint and heavy gloss, uh, those don't work very well. Same thing, if you ever take a drumstick and go against the grain, you hear that kind of pterodactyl sound, that... Yeah, yeah. You can get that much easier on Zildjian <laughs> and Sabian symbols because they got more grit. Most okay. of the Pisces, uh, they put a sheen on them that, that uh, there's only a couple of the traditional Pisces that work well with that scrape. Okay, yeah, almost well. like those little grooves almost, you know. And yeah, but when you have too stick, much, that's what you need. The bow, mm -hmm. since you're on the edge, doesn't quite need that, but it, it needs to have friction. Yeah. What's a album that you use the symbol on or a song where we could go and say oh there it is well i guess typically they're kind of hidden in them in the mix of everything i know it's uh i'll, I'll make a piece for you sometime yeah okay <laughs> but, yeah I'm just i'd be curious to hear it okay for stuff for some movie thing i can't remember what it what it even was mm -hmm. and it's it's on the the uh, record i made with tobias there's some symbol introductions and, and things like that yeah 
Very cool. I'll keep an eye out. Um, oh, just looking in the chat room. Mark Greenbaum says hello. Hey, Pat and Deborah. And uh, Mark Cook says much love to Deb and Pat. Um, Mark is on the I got to give Mark a Mark is great. Oh great my gosh, player. he does. He's some got a band work. called the, the Herd of Instincts. Yes, Herd of Instinct. In, instinct or Instincts? Instinct. Okay. Sounds familiar. They're up in Dallas. They're a prog band you should know. He plays stick and, and touch guitar and Whoa. bass. Uh, he did some beautiful stuff. Uh, he plays on Exiles and he plays on uh, uh, Moonchild. Oh, Not man. many notes, but he's got a beautiful part. The bass comes in for like uh, four bars or gorgeous. something. He plays about 12 notes. And they're perfect. 12 it's perfect so great. notes. Yeah. And then it's all notes. Now, his partner in Herd of Instinct is Mark McGarry. And, and Mark's the trumpet. Flugelhorn. flugelhorn. His flugelhorn is haunting. In about three different songs, you can hear that interesting flugelhorn. Oh, I love some flugelhorn. You know, every big Chuck Mangione fan, too, you know. And yeah, he was. He doesn't sound like Chuck. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's see who else is in here real quick. Oh, Fernando Perdomo says hi also. Oh, hi. hi, Fernando. Fernando. Fernando will probably be on the show here in the next month or so. He's got a really cool album he just did of Todd Rundgren tunes. And, wow. Uh, yeah. I, I'm He's a, in. He's in. I, I'm like the kid that wore the Todd is God t-shirt. Oh, me too. Uh, oh, man. Yeah. I'm just... He was my guy. Oh. If you get the, the, the Todd record, remember it came with a poster? Yeah, the one where his hair is three different colors on the front. Yes, but it came with a fold-out poster. So from a wizard to true star, you could send in a postcard. It came with a postcard. You send it in to have your name on his next record. So my name is in his eye. You're in there. Okay, so you found it, huh? Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. You're not the only one I've met that's been on there. I, I wish I, I... A lot of dudes on that. Yeah, I wish I was hip to him back then, but I would have been, I don't know, eight, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. So, yeah. What's your favorite Todd album? Uh, that's, that's tough to ask. I think the Wizard of Tristar and and the Todd record. But I just was playing Deb stuff off of Runt um, and, and the uh, the ballad of Todd. Yeah. 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 Be nice to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we went down a road there. <laughs> it took us from the Beach Boys over to Todd. But. Well, that's a good connection in a way because you know those early Todd albums. I think probably have a little to do with kind of the in the vein of Beach Boys and that kind of stuff meets kind Laura of Nero. I hear a lot a lot I was freak for Laura Nero when I was growing up. And oh yeah, totally. Yeah. And Laura were the first records of, of Todd. Yeah, I think Todd was on the track to be like the the male version of Laura Nero or Carol King. And then when he got to Wizard, he's like, I'm doing some riddling and some peyote and I'm making a completely <laughs> different record. Forget success i'm going to do my thing and and bless him for it you know because he made you know i think that's one of the most fertile parts of his career it's fantastic yeah Just you know really all the side stuff and you made me think of something i would have been about 17 when i left home and was living on my own every house even this house we're in the first record that gets on the turntable is uh, wizard of two star oh that's awesome well fernando did international feel from that one so there's a, there's some wizard on that record for sure. So, so really going to fall in your yard. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. God, I love that record. I think that might be my favorite. Um, Initiation is another great one too. That really great. Yeah. Super proggy stuff on that one. You know, especially that. Bars, we used to go to the shows at the Roxy. So me and some of my friends, here, we could think we're the guys you can hear heckling and yelling. <laughs> That's you know, awesome. And the Utopia records, man, those were great. That yes. singing oh. tour where he had the uh, the pyramid, the glass pyramid. Right, exactly. He ended up going to the top of the pyramid and fall, somersaulting off of that. Right, yeah. I think that was the Raw tour. Yeah. In fact, I saw the original Utopia because that was right when I moved to Los Angeles. Oh, really? The one with the Sales Brothers? No, no, no. Sorry about that. Maybe it wasn't the original then, but that did. Freak Parade and all that. So it was. Oh, uh, sure. Yeah. The the uh, first one with Kevin Elman on drums. Kevin, exactly. Elman, Elman. And the, uh, that was at San Monica Civic. And uh, uh, well, I wasn't sure if I remembered some of the things I saw. So when I met Todd years and years later, I said, did a bunch of ping pong balls fall from the sky during that show? Or did I just hallucinate that? <laughs> and he said, saying? no, a bunch of ping pong balls did fall. <laughs> Okay. Well, I did a camp at our um, music masters camp a yeah, couple of yeah. a couple of years in a row. He did a camp up there, like before us, 
or after us? Yeah, they call it the music master's camp. So uh, we're just a small piece of it, four or five days. But the weeks before us, Almond Brother guys, uh, Yorma, there's acoustic guitar uh, from, from Starship, Yorma Kukawan. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's great. I can't think who he's up there with, but uh, uh, you know, different, different angle to each camp. I think Modesky and Martin Wood, they might have done something. Oh, yeah, I love them. I went through a big MMW phase back in the 90s. Yeah. yeah. When I, I moved down to Atlanta here, and, and I lived in Athens, actually, for a while, which is about an hour from here. And, you know, I got really familiar with the jam band scene. You know, it's very, very strong down here, you know. Um, you know, thanks to the Almond Brothers, it's kind of the roots. And, uh, yeah, you know, I know, you know, I just love good playing. I'm not really too picky about the style, you know, it's all good. And I've got a guy, Murray Attaway. Did you know Murray down there in Athens? Yeah, it doesn't sound familiar. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's a, that's a funky little town. I really like it. Um, it's fun to get up there every once in a while and visit. So tell me a bit more about the record. Um, tell me about the cover art. Uh, who did that? Well, um, Right when I met Deborah, um, her, I guess, was she staying at your house? She Off was, and on. Yeah. She's one of my really good friends, and she's from Mexico City. So kind of a big deal down there and all over, really. Her name's Maybe. Ana Fuente. Fuentes. 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 Yeah. And she does these beautiful paintings. She's very prolific. So anytime she's ever stayed in my house, she takes over the house. She's, there's paint everywhere. It's so fun. We let her house sit sometimes if I'm on tour and Deb's going to come over for a couple of weeks a lot of times it coincides she might be in the states so she's a great house sitter and I built a small studio for painting in the back of our property here for Deborah but I use it sometimes and other reasons we use it but she well actually she doesn't like to paint up there she likes to paint in the house so she, once we're gone she throws out the tarps and clears out the living room I think. not bad so you know just watch the house and paint something new for us while you're at it right well, <laughs> A lot of her art she do, isn't finished, so it stays here until she comes back. Or, uh, I mean, it's hard to transport if she goes home, you know, it's tricky because they're the, starting to tax. You know, she can't take a canvas, even an unrolled canvas, in and out of the country. They want to pay duties. You uh, know? I mean, even the last time, when was it that I got stuck? Um, yeah. oh, yeah, because in between Crimson tours, I'll do Stickman or somebody else. So, most of my equipment with Crimson stays with Crimson. But a few things, my little goodie bag of percussion toys and my sampling device and these things I take back and forth in my suitcase. And it cost a couple thousand dollars for me to bring them down there to, because they wouldn't believe that I already owned them. They thought I was, was really, you know, going to resell strange. them down in Mexico. Oh, that's crazy. She does so much yeah. beautiful work. We knew that when we did an album that we wanted something that she did on the cover. And so we scrolled through until we found something that kind of had a the feeling of, I wanted it to be pretty. <laughs> that sounds funny compared, you know, considering it's a King Crimson album, but I, I wanted it to be pretty and I wanted it to look like art. We even had figured out how to lay it out so that when you hold the album up, it goes flip, flip down like this. And those are the two piece, two paintings are facing the same way with uh, the set list in the middle. Yeah, I got to give credit to Dennis uh, Roger, who's up in near Montreal in Quebec. Canada, Quebec, sorry. And uh, if you don't know Dennis, he's been involved since, well, I met him through Tony. So he did the Tony Levin band artwork back with Jerry and, and uh, the, the Tony Levin band kind of cartoons. I remember we that. think of him as cartoons because he does Batman and Superman comics professionally the Did real deal you do the uh, cartoon versions of you guys on the three of yeah. a perfect pair summer camp poster Absolutely. yes he's yeah. done all of them great and great stuff he's a great he's a drummer so sometimes i've traded drum gear with him to get artwork he's done almost all my projects but they're completely different that's what's so beautiful with with uh with dennis is they don't you know if you look at the comoro record where the art the drawing uh the image came from Adam, from Tool, Adam Jones. Mm -hmm. The design, the layout, um, Dennis and I did that over the weekend. It was a Friday night. We had to get it off Monday morning. So I had to ask the other guys in the band, step out of this, just let me and Dennis finish this one. Because we did all these lacquer overlays. If you get the real Comora CD, it's a beautiful, beautiful package. Very dark <laughs> artwork, but beautiful package. Mm -hmm. So similar with all these things, um, if you get into Toporama record, which I did with 
with Tobias, that's a left-handed record. It opens up backwards. And that was my tribute to Ginger Baker, who did a left-handed, Ginger Baker's Air Force was a left-handed oh, LP. Oh, okay. And I said, hey, so, you know, some guys would say, what are you doing here? And then you got to explain to the uh, disc maker, hey, it's not backwards, that's what we want. <laughs> and this one was equally challenging because... To, to have it drop down and have everything read the right way. Well, if you open it this way, some shit's upside down. So Dennis is great. He, he, he did the BPM record. If you ever look at that, that BPM uh, came with a poster and that poster coincidentally was my tribute to Todd Rundgren, something, anything where he's in the hotel room with his arms out like sure. Nixon. Oh yeah. It's littered with gear everywhere you look oh there's a revox machine oh there's a strat in the corner or whatever oh, yeah you look at the bpm record it's essentially a cop on that but done in cartoon of my garage <laughs> oh i get it that's cool you know i saw todd do one of these all encompassing looks at his career when he toured a year or two ago and that's the very picture he had on on behind him on stage was that 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 famous shot? Yeah, so. I want to know someday. I, I don't know why it's in my head that that's at the uh, at the Hyatt on Sunset, but I don't I, know. I think that that's at a house because there's a video on YouTube where they go to the house. I could be mistaken, but it's some house up in the hills. Really nice pad that he was living in back then. Well, he was the Hermit of Mink Hollow, which is another great record. Yeah, it was, but it wasn't on Mink Hollow. It was like before he moved there, I think. Yeah. So yeah. XTC reported because yeah. I heard stories from them about working with Todd at that place. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, you know, I'm every day I feature a different album to talk about on my Facebook page because I just like to talk music on Facebook. You know, I don't <laughs> want to oh, talk God. about anything too deep. I just want to talk about music and kind of keep it nice. And that's what I've done for almost 10 years now. And um, last week I featured three of a perfect pair and, hundred replies everybody loves that record then this week well since you're on i thought well i'm gonna feature an album that pat's on so i featured oranges and lemons today okay. which is one of my favorite xdc albums and i was saying that it the music is as varied and as colorful as the art on the cover you know i think uh you that know was intentional you know uh for andy i mean i i remember he talked about that while we were making the record that it, he wanted to, he said, he, I want a dragster with all the chrome. <laughs> he said, what's the use in having a top if you can't go over it? Good because point. There were definitely times, myself, Paul Fox, other people were saying, you know, we're, maybe we cut this back a little, a lot of overdubs going on. Yeah. He said, I don't know. I want the dragster with all the chrome. Nice. So how did you get involved with that project? Um, through the producer, Paul Fox. Okay. Was a friend. We worked together a lot and, um, and he was starting to, well, he was an arranger and keyboard player and we'd done sessions together. And then when he started to branch out and do more production and, uh, and alternative mixing and things like that, because I was a buddy, he'd call me up to help do overdubs. You know, I was a, a, a convenient guy to come in and help finish something. That's how I came to work with, uh, Robin Hitchcock and, sugar cubes and some of those things. I came in to just do a little fixing or a little overdubbing to help him. Uh, and then one day he calls, he says, I've got another gig for you. And he says, it's XTC. And I said, like, fuck you, you're, you're, it's bullshit. What are you talking about? And he said, no, I'm serious. I said, you're, you're, you're pulling my leg. And he said, no, I'm totally serious. Check your mailbox. If it's not there, there should be very soon a delivery. He said, he sent a courier over. You could do that in LA. You send a runner. And he was dropping three cassettes. And uh, so I go check my mailbox and call Paul back. I said, you're serious. There's three cassettes, about 40 tunes here. He says, yeah, you got some homework to do. They're coming over in a couple of weeks. Oh, so, that's awesome. Yeah. And I'm taking that you were quite hip to them and a fan already anyway, right? In fact, sometimes I wondered if I might have turned Paul on to him because we used to really, you know, after sessions, we'd drift off together and listen to music a lot of times. And um uh, and I can remember listening to XTC and Thomas Dolby and things like that uh, with Paul. And um, to be totally clear, Paul, Paul was totally straight with me. He says, I don't know if the guys are going to like you when they get here. It's, you know, you're my guy. So we'll see, you know, maybe you rehearse a few days and then we have to pull the plug. So, uh, you know, he already told me that. Uh, yeah. He, okay. He said they were looking for Tony Williams. He said they wanted Tony Williams to play on a couple tracks. So he warned me up front. He says, 
even if things go well, you're not going to play on the whole record. <laughs> and and it. And in the end, you did though, didn't you? Well, we got ahead of schedule. Is what happened. Really, they okay. booked about two and a half, three weeks at Ocean Way to cut the tracks, and um, I don't remember how many. If we we rehearsed about thirty tunes, you know, we rehearsed maybe two weeks, three, two or three weeks, like five days a week, just to go through all this material and prepare you know, the backing. If there was a, a sequence part or a drum machine part, you have to get all that stuff cleared out and, and try different arrangement ideas. And for me, I know the old XTC song. So, you know, I could start to play Nigel and they'd all jump in and play because they hadn't played a live gig in what, 20 years? Sure. You know? Oh, I bet that was a thrill just to get them going on some of that old stuff. I know it's great. It's great fun. And like I say, we got ahead of time cutting tracks. So because I was there in the studio, was they said, well, you want to try this one too. And that would have been miniature sun and maybe chalk hills was, was one that I wasn't supposed to play, uh, but they say, Hey, we'll just have a go at it tonight. Are there some songs from the, that batch initially that didn't make the record that you heard later, like on non such or some of those other records later? I don't think so. The, the couple ones that stay in my head, I'm not sure. There's one about um, uh, written from the animal perspective about don't trust those humans that come at you with their shiny, you know, utensils. Yes. <laughs> that might be redone on one of the later records. Hmm, that's a good question. And uh, what was your favorite XTC album aside from the one that you were on? Well, that, that's not my favorite. <laughs> Sorry, uh, but I love them all. But I'm really attached to Go To because that's the my first experience with them. I really love that. And then right on through Drums and Wars, Black Sea, fantastic. And I got to see him right then uh, oh, wow. at the Whiskey. Uh, I was doing a session at Ocean Way actually with Mike Chapman uh, back then. And I'd asked Mike. I said Friday, I really want to get done early. Can I start tracking early? Because I want to go see this band. You know, can we be done by nine o'clock? Is what I was basically asking the producer. Can I be out of here by nine for sure? And as it turned out, he uh, was interested to hear some XTC. I must have played him something. He said, "Let's all go." <laughs> so he he made phone calls because I would I would have been buying a ticket. You know, in those days. So. Well, that's great. Just a chance to see them live. I mean, that's, that's a rare thing, you know? Um, yeah. I just love everything they did, you know, and I think it's so cool that you're a part of that. Um, I think drums and wires was the first one I heard and uh, it still has got a special place in my heart. There's just something about the way that Dave and Andy's guitars mesh together and same on black sea, you know, Big express just the way they start with wake up. That's, that's just great. And you know, I got to say the drum programming on that record is really quite good. He's great. That's um, he doesn't get any credits really. Andy. Yeah. Right. Uh, Phipps. Oh, okay. Peter Phipps. I forget the drummer's name, unfortunately. Sorry, dude. But I think he's one of Adam and the ants. He was one of the early double drummers. And uh, okay. yeah. Very Which I think cool. also Chris Hughes, if you know the producer, Chris Hughes, uh, somebody has got to back me up. I might be wrong about all this, but I think Chris Hughes was also, you know, the producer from Tears for Fears and things like that. He was okay. originally a drummer. Yeah. Question for you. Um, who did you feel were bands that were your contemporaries when you were in Mr. Mister? Um, well, that's, I don't know really, because I mean, I would say some of the stuff that was on the radio then, um, uh, you know, we, we got thrown in the batch with Toto a lot. Okay, we're session guys from LA, so we're like Toto and uh, Chicago, because Rich had that offer to join Chicago. But I don't think we had much musical relationship with that. Um, you know, our common ground within the band was actually Steely Dan and Weather Report. Those are the records that we all, you know, it was, it was actually difficult. I'll tell you that um, I'm trying to think contemporaries also, but I'm trying to think of this little story where I remember playing Richard Page uh, Peter Gabriel, well, he, I didn't play it for Rich. He'd gone to bed in the bus. I'm up in the front or back lounge having a, having a cocktail, and I've got music on it. It happens to be Peter Gabriel's third record, you know, uh, yeah, the, the, the melt And it was during no self-control that the back door to the lounge opened. Rich walked out, popped the cassette out of the player, and threw it out of the, the top of the bus, the chute. <laughs> <laughs> now, 
he didn't know who Peter was. He just was annoyed, but whatever that was. He was trying to sleep. Huh? Yes. But uh, a day later, Rich goes to do the, inter- when we go to every town, you have to do the radio interview thing. So we split up. Rich comes back to the bus after one of these interviews. He says, I've got the greatest record you guys are ever going to hear. It's this guy called Peter Gabriel. It was the So record. Rich uh-huh. had gotten an advanced copy at the radio station and heard Sledgehammer. And I said, Rich, that is exactly the guy whose cassette you threw away. You owe me a cassette. I've got the box, but there's no cassette. Yeah. So, and what you think? Our, I don't know our contemporaries. Did so blow your mind when you sat down and listened to it the first time? Or Absolutely. In fact, I didn't buy another Peter Gable record after that because they were so good. Uh, <laughs> if that makes any sense, I would just absorb it and steal. And I just... Like I, I tried to stop listening to the police, the same, everybody's starting to sound like Stuart Copeland. He's so good. It's like, mm-hmm. I'll hear that record on the radio. I don't need to play Right. It. You're going to hear it enough. Anyway, that kind of reminds me of uh, uh, Robert avoiding Mahavishnu back in the seventies because he didn't want to be, what was the word enticed by it? <laughs> Something along those lines, you know? And um, so, so tell me a bit more about the record. Um, where's the best place to get it? Bandcamp. Well, no, no. The best place to get it is 7D, 7D oh, Records, which is uh, Trey Gunn's label. Seven, the number of 7D. Sure. Mm-hmm. And he calls it 7D Media. So, so as we were getting close to putting this out, I didn't really know what to do. And <laughs> talked to a couple other people that were not as enthusiastic. And Trey was like, this sounds great. And, and it was actually Trey said, you know, if we do it fast, we can have it by Valentine's Day. So this was we're only talking about November, a few months ago that we Oh yeah, that is pretty quick. Well, we weren't anyway. It's it's a long, long, long story. You know, we were actually trying to get it done much earlier last year, um, but everything spun slower once COVID got going. Yeah, well, uh, the, uh, the things would speed up because suddenly he's not touring, and um, he's not leaving the house. He's home all the time. But it did. You talk to a lot of people, and they're you're not quite as productive during that time off as you think you should be. We started really kind of enjoying our time together alone in the house just kind of in the garden we started to garden you know it's just it's crazy what we got really domestic i started baking a lot yeah it was the house smells like bread all the time sounds good to me that sounds awesome i kind of went down a black hole there for a month or two i got a little a little depressed so i wasn't i I wasn't so keen on working in music 2020 was the year of depression you know i mean yeah i I came out of it everybody's gonna oh yeah i I kind of felt that way too especially when it first happened it was just like you know music seems a little trivial compared to what's happening now how can i get excited about it but after about three months it was kind of became a salvation you know and this doing this show helped too but um just having some things to focus on after getting unemployed and all that fun stuff i've got lots of time on my hands so it definitely took a while to kind of get in a headspace where music seemed appealing again but this year i forced myself to record a new song every week that's my year my new year's resolution and i've got four down so far so that's uh, sort of what i started to do that became this uh, portal thing that i do with lorenzo felicciati mm-hmm. uh, italian bass player we did but i would get in the habit for years, actually, when I just start in the morning to press go and record just to warm up or, you know, record a couple five minutes of drumming and send those off to Lorenzo for years. And then he sends it back and forth. And the way we released the record, we released it there in November uh, as two records, one instrumental and the other with Deborah. So Deborah plays the, the role of the late night DJ. So uh, she's all over that record. She's also on my Tunisia record. Uh, a long time with the theremin player oh very cool we've, we've, we've collaborated on a few things but this was this was intense this was full on I well it's awesome a whole record before so it was really and to have that kind of input you know it's one thing to say come here and sing this part this way you know in this microphone here do this spoken word piece and we want it to sound like this but pat gave me i mean we we had a he gave me a lot of opportunity to have input in even the arrangements oh, and what kind of instrument we wanted to play and how totally. we wanted it to sound. Well, I think everything I tried to do really was interpreting through Deborah. Um, you know, like she said before, you said just make it pretty, <laughs> and, and and that's like pretty. <laughs> how do I make it pretty? 
<laughs> but that was that became the operative word. Mm -hmm. And and he could and he went off. You can hear it. His pet stuff, his drum stuff, and you know he's not being anyone other than Pat Mastellato. And it's still beautiful and it's still quirky and unusual, but it's also pretty. And that you know the whole album. I wanted it to be pretty. I wanted it to be the kind of album that if you were a huge King Crimson fan and you have been dying because your wife or your girlfriend or your sister doesn't want anything to do with King Crimson and makes you take the record off, you give her this record and it's almost like a gateway to liking Crimson because it's beautiful Crimson songs that she'll be humming or listening to in her car. It's like a mixtape is what we wanted it to sound like. Like if you were Dagan girl and you made her a mixtape and gave it to her like we used to do, that's what I we wanted it to feel like, sort of. Yeah. There's a tape, and there's all the most romantic crimson songs. Yeah, and they're not just ballads either. You know, I mean, oh. there's stuff like Elephant Talk on here that is kind of done up in kind of a kind of sultry way. <laughs> well, yeah, I when when uh, Deborah does it, I was going to say Deborah does a thing in a car, but that's the wrong <laughs> way to put this. Um, <laughs> she'll be she'll do the navigation for me. Her voice is much better, and I don't know how to work the navigation. He calls it my 900 number voice. Yeah, so. And, <laughs> so, well, you know, you can make it kind of sound sexy and interesting, and it makes the words, suddenly Adrian's words take on a whole new meaning when it's done like that. Oh, absolutely. Well, I think it's a great angle to go at, and I think it's perfect just in time for Valentine's Day, too. So. That was our idea. So what was your favorite song? Every year. I, yeah. ah, gosh, I think my favorite was probably Moonchild. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Uh, just... That was Laura Scarborough's. Uh, she is a, a an amazing multi instrumentalist, and she wor she's working in Europe right now. And she, we brought her in to do Exile. Exile. Uh, well. I'll step back a little tiny bit. Yeah, Laura's a, a, an Austinite that we've known for quite a while and worked a little bit with, and she's moved off to Europe. And we ran into her, actually. The, the Deborah flew in for the gig, I think it was in Holland, and and actually we met her at the airport, accidentally. Oh, so then For we the 40th anniversary. Yeah, yeah. She, had, that's, she ended up at, at Royal Albert Hall. That's what it was. Uh -huh. And we were able to score her. It was her night off because she had an equally big gig at another big venue there that she doesn't want me to talk about. But anyways, because she plays a sideman gig in this other big production. Wow. So um, really talented musician. So that was already nesting. And then um, just before we went to Japan to make that, uh, what became the Awari record, mm -hmm. uh, we got a tool, the band tool we're playing here. And, and uh, Danny and Adam called to invite me down and actually sit in. So we uh, did that. And then at the end, we go backstage and there's Laura. So it's like, what are you doing here? She said, I'm back home visiting for a couple of days. We go, come to our house. Please, please, please. This was pre-COVID, you know. We said, right. So she came um, actually for two or three days. She, and then she left and then she came back again. So she has this vibes, custom-made vibe set that is like a Franken, Frankenstein's monster. And it is so, you can hear it in Moonchild. Just this eerie, that's Laura. And she also plays keyboards, and, uh, and she's a fantastic songwriter. Um, so we, she's helped with uh, Inner Garden. There's some beautiful bowing on there with a cymbal. That's a cymbal you can hear on, on the vibraphone on uh, several plants in the verses throughout Inner Garden. You hear that, like swellings, swelling chords. But uh, was the other two are exiles because she we needed somebody to block out all the keyboards, so she could have just blocked us out and gone away and but let us. But she's piano. like, hang on, let's get this right. It was so <laughs> beautiful what she did yeah. on Exile. It yeah, just, she, uh, she loved the materials. So like I'm saying, she could have been in and out of here in a few hours, and she didn't want to. And then when we got to Moonchild, because we we're Moonchild was tough in a way, because. I tried to do it some way I can't remember even with drums. It's been covered so many times that it was tricky to do it in a way that no one had done before. But we didn't want to do it the way other people had covered it. Moonchild is probably as frequently covered as uh, Madakutasa. And so, so we were heading in a different direction. Uh, we headed in several different directions on several of the songs. But this one, we had gone in sort of a trip hop direction. And then I heard uh, Bat for Lashes. 
You know, they, I don't know if you know There's the band. Bad Bad There's this one song, Girl Plays Drums. I think they were on NPR, a Tom Tom thing. And I said, or maybe actually Deborah said, because I thought there's no way that could work. And I think you kept saying, yes, it could work. Yes, it could work. So if you could imagine having Moonchild with behind it, almost like uh, Cook Island drumming, like really busy drumming going on. And we, even when Laura came, that's the way I presented the song. Remember I said, well, we have this vague idea. Uh, I had taken a, a live Crimson show uh, somewhere in Japan so we could have a sketch of the chords to play to, to start with, uh, and pulled everything away, uh, except for the Mellotron. We had kept a Mellotron okay. from that performance to help us sketch it out while we tried to find our key and, and find the arrangement. And then that totally changed when Laura came in. Well, what she said was as she's leaving, she's walking down the stairs and she turns around and said, I really want to work on Moonchild with you. I really, really do. Pat and I looked at each other and we said, what would you do? And she said something totally different. We're like, okay, cool. <laughs> so we slowed, slowed it down even more. And then kind of a critical thing to me in it is, um, is the gaps. It made the spaces bigger. Because I, I don't know what feeling you get, but I really wanted to be floating. Airy. Uh, oh, yeah, so yeah. Look, so you're never really tethered. You think after two bars here, she, the vocal comes. But it, it doesn't. It's, you're going to hang for, we're going to hang there even longer. So there's a lot of, of uh, stretching in it. Anyway. Very cool. Very cool. Well, what are some other favorites that um, now that it's all done? They're all favorites. Yeah, I guess they all are. <laughs> I love book of Saturday. I love the lyrics. I, the lyrics spoke to me in a way that made me feel like I had written them myself. Oh, that's and, awesome. um, it, just like I said, flipping the pronouns so that I am, experience having this experience of having a lover that has this whole other world that i'm just in the periphery i'm not really in the middle of it and i'm witnessing it and you know also things are happening in my life that i have to make some decisions about like is this the direction i want to go with my life is this what how i want to live it and um pat, that was the first song that kind of set the tone for how we wanted to do the record, but we weren't exactly sure of its approach. And then we got a chance to visit with Bill Rieflin during Christmas. We spent some time with him. That sadly is the last Christmas he spent. And he was sharing with us some things that he'd been working on and he had a harp in something. He did a version of Schizoid Man. Have you heard that? Is it released? I think it might be with on a Toya, Toya record. Toya. I don't have to look for that. Okay. Uh, harp? Harp? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. I can't even imagine. And that's when I that went, was Ting Tong, a harp. I need a harp to, to set the tone of, of uh, Book of Saturn. We didn't have a harp. There was no harp player in our, you know, Not, No harp player at the one. camp. No. <laughs> Almost every other instrument we could dig through our campers and go, oh yeah, there's a horn player over there, you know? Right, but harp, that's a rare one anyway, you know? Yeah, Laura. Yeah, Laura knew. Laura Scarborough said, I got the, a harp. Uh, Austin Symphony. So. Oh, nice. Found yeah. us a harp, Elaine Barber. Yeah, mm -hmm. and we recorded that in my living room. I shot some video uh, while we were recording, just me with my iPhone, kind of no big deal stuff. But uh, we're just making um, a YouTube page. Uh, my friend Master Lefto, my left stick, he's been taking care of my... Uh, social media for about a year now uh, Very nice. so if you see some irreverent commentary he has my permission he can say whatever <laughs> he wants i trust him so uh yeah he's helping me he rebuilt my website now he's helping we're launching he helped me relaunch Bandcamp. and while i think of it um um i did some mixing for stephen wilson about 10 or 12 years ago i've actually been working on some mixing for him this last month as well so not to be oh, very cool yeah but this older stuff uh, never really saw the light of day and it had some interesting kind of metric manipulation, um, which was hard to explain. And I got asked to do something for PASIC, the Percussive Arts Society, a virtual NAM show for drummers. This would have been in November. And um, so I thought, well, this is something I could explain to drummers that they'd get into this idea of how you superimpose the tempo. So I created a, uh, very difficult for me to learn this, what is that thing called? OBO, OB, that one, OBS. To learn OBS, how you put yourself in the screen like you're gonna do a tutorial. 
anyway, I made this video and now I have Stephen's permission to put it out. So we're putting it out maybe tomorrow or the next day. And then we'll put the mixes out on Friday on Bandcamp. Some of those mixes from 12 years ago. Okay. And the other stuff, his record's just out, I think today or yesterday. Yeah, I was going to say he's the man of the week, isn't he? You know, it just came yeah. out and he's making the rounds and, um, and it's a little different, but you know, I mean, I've been listening to his music for over 20 years. So to me, it's just all Steven Wilson. I, you know, you can change the backdrop, but it's still Steven, you know, you know, I, I know there's a lot of prog people that are up in arms. How can you make a prog album? How can you make an electronic album? It's like, you ain't his daddy. He can do whatever he wants. Get over it. You know, you're not his, you know, you're not, a pos he's not your possession, you know, Progressive. Let's progress. <laughs> right. You know, you can't just keep doing the same thing over and over again. So, but yeah, yeah. Kudos to him. Good luck with that. I, you know, I, what I've heard sounds great. So, yeah. Uh, well, that's cool that you're doing some stuff with him as well. It's funny that you're doing mixes for him because usually he's the one doing mixes for other people. You know? Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> the first song that when, when Pat first worked with him, he said, here, I'm oh, going to yeah. send you three songs and you can pick one. And so Pat's like, well, what if I do all three? And then <laughs> what if I do three versions of those three songs? So he had nine songs. That's basically an album of the same songs, but Pat handles it totally, each song completely different. And I got to listen to him work on that stuff for- It was just starting, that would have been 2000. We weren't married yet, uh -uh. I don't think. But I can go back a little few months, years before that, that um, I think it's how I met Stephen was through Tim uh, Bonus that sure. was on our uh, Tuner Records, the first one Marcus and I made. He's on the last track. I can't think of the name right now, but um, and he works with Stephen. They call it No Man. Oh yeah, good stuff. So he invited me to play on a track for him and Stephen. Uh, it was actually kind of funny. I'll I'll be completely honest about this. Um, they sent me a track to work on. I I played something similar to the demo, and I sent it back. And they replied to each other in an email. Stephen said, "This really isn't what I'm looking for. I don't like it." Um, but they sent the email to me accidentally. <laughs> so I, said, I just sort of followed the path of the demo. I'll send you something different tomorrow. So uh, that's whatever was on the No Man record. But I was just starting to date Deborah, and I said, "I've got this." thing I've never really heard. And you say? I already, I have that record. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I had the record. It's probably, I mean, my mother always said there's somebody for everybody in this world. <laughs> I didn't know another human being that was listening to No Man. I was the only person that I knew. I had, I'd never life. heard of it, you know, and, and here my girlfriend says, hey, I've got it right here. I had some clients that were DJs though, and so I got an opportunity to hear music that other people didn't get to. Yeah, was say, what's some of your favorite stuff, Deborah? Oh goodness, um, it's I like loungy, jazzy, twisty music. I like I like a group called Dining Rooms. Have you ever heard of Dining Rooms? No, no. no see what I mean? Um, it's uh, instrumental. There are no lyrics and no vocals at all, and it's just this odd kind of thing that I don't even know how to describe it. And I really got into acid jazz when acid jazz was out for a while when there was when it was a thing. Mm -hmm. but also, you know, Michelle Deggio cello. I, She's I awesome. Like jazz, jazz. But I have had a salon for years and I was in charge of the music. So if you think about what kind of like edgy, but not obnoxious music you like to hear while you're in a very hip hair salon, that's I was always looking for new music to play in my salon. I became quickly aware that as a musician, um, I've got blinders on. I'm working on my thing all the time, and I don't really look out a whole lot. Um, and exactly the opposite. Deborah's 12 hours a day in a hair salon, you know, turn the lights on, turn the lights off, and turn the music on through the whole time. And she wants, you know, stuff that will keep her clients but herself, everybody interested throughout the day. Sure. Uh, Lark's tongues and aspic. <laughs> <laughs> And my teenage daughter, there's a, yeah, you know, yeah. so the younger people in our life bring music into it. Yeah, she, your daughter always had great taste in music. Were you into much of the progressive stuff or did that become kind of a new my role to you? My daughter introduced me to King Crimson. Okay. My daughter had to tell me when I started dating Pat, she's like, you don't know who he is, do you? <laughs> Here, let me tell you who he is. And she had to give me a couple records and I was just like, I don't think I can listen to this right now. 
It's <laughs> <laughs> sure. So I think it, it took a while to warm up to and seeing it live, I'm sure probably I've changed my opinion about King Crimson. Absolutely. Sheesh. And also seeing Adrian Ballou sing walking on air with a, in Chicago with a girl standing in front of him, tears just streaming down her face. Security came and tried to move her and he would not let her because she was having a moment with him. He knew it. She was in love with that song. And finally she gets to see him sing it live and it was overwhelming and in that moment i thought you know the problem is that women don't get to hear that part of king crimson because their husbands will or boyfriends will sit around the chair put headphones on and said here listen to red from start to finish yeah. like it's it's too much but if you can pick those moments like that moment with him singing walking on air to her if there were a whole album of those moments you could make a fan out of any woman in your life. That's really the motivation behind making this record, if you want to know the truth, Sean. I think that'll work. <laughs> Can I share? And I'm going to have Deborah share. I'm going to put her on the spot. But at the same, the, the, she's talking about 2008 when the band did a short run with, uh, with Gavin. Or with Gavin Gun. Yeah, I remember. Uh, and um, so those were the first times Deborah saw Crimson was uh, Chicago and then New York, I think. And um, so also in Chicago, besides this particular woman she described, <laughs> tell her about the other woman. Okay, so I'm going into the restroom and you know at Crimson shows, there's never a line into the women's restroom. So you just walk right in and there is a woman holding on to the sink, just <laughs> shaking her head saying, make it stop, just make it stop. And she turned to me and said, is it just me? or is this music unlistenable? And I said, you're talking to the wrong person. I'm sleeping with the drummer. <laughs> which <laughs> one? <laughs> no. exactly. She didn't ask me which one. <laughs> <laughs> it just, it's just funny. You know, it just all those experiences of watching the way women respond to one side of King Crimson, but also another side of King Crimson. That's, I think, has always been the seed in my head about what, this album is is an introduction this is the sweet romantic side of king crimson without the loud stuff sure and i think once we get into south america where crimson's been playing this last uh well two or three years ago now but once we hit mexico about uh whatever that whenever that was anyway there's a lot more oh, yeah. female involvement they love in king crimson. crimson music um with with women once you get out of America, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, we're America. in Mexico City, and after a couples, show, they seem to be couples. Like, the women seeing... would bring in stacks of King Crimson records for the guys to sign that they'd been collecting since high school, you know. And women just like singing the songs out loud, word for word. In Chile, Argentina, same kind of thing. It just seems to be American women are have a hard time with it, I guess. Yeah, they need to lighten up and expand their horizons. <laughs> I'm helping, yeah. Sean. I'm trying they to You are. Heck yeah. That's the, that's the ticket. Um, what, what was that big festival? I saw some footage of you guys down in South America, I think. And you had the big logo behind you where it said King Crimson, and it was on YouTube for a hot minute and then taken down. I think you mean Rock and Rio. Oh, yeah. Wow. That must have been. You know what that is, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Queen and those, you know, phenomenal big shows. And uh, That's a far cry from seeing you guys at 12th and Porter. Far cry. I'm <laughs> as far as you could get, you know. Um, was that like the biggest audience Crimson had ever played to? I'm not really sure. But in case you don't know, when you do a festival like that, this might be interesting or not, is that in this case, I think we had to be up at about six in the morning to go in and sound check at about eight or nine and then get the hell out of there by 10 and come back at nine o'clock and play, you know, without right. touching your gear. And hopefully so nobody crazy. else did either in the meantime. <laughs> you know, with Crimson, we usually uh, control our environment pretty well. Yeah, kind of in a uh, bubble. Security, you know, even with uh, our undercover you know, our uh, four quarters people and things like that. And we usually keep our dressing rooms uh, private. We don't, we don't have a uh, people backstage pre-show that it's not the crimson way. And we, we do a sound check and then we practice <laughs> individually. We all sort of spin off besides, uh, you know, grabbing dinner or something. We spent a couple, three hours. So we didn't get that really on this gig was an odd gig in that way. There's people all over on the wings of the stage and you just, have to deal with 
well, it's still great to see you guys in that context, you know, and a hundred thousand people saw you that might not have. So that's, I think yeah, that's there's a, good. there's a picture. I, I guess I saw it on Instagram and reposted it. Uh, the girl that was at uh, rock and Rio and she had, what did she paint on her face? Was it track or she had, uh, but just not your typical crimson girl. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. Not, how many crimson tattoos have you seen in your day? Too many. Uh, yeah. I was going to say, if you see, you probably see some great ones and some not so great ones. Well, I don't really look at them, but they, they it, it, I've been around when the word comes backstage, so and so wants you to come out and see this tattoo. You know, there's a guy back at once in. Well, I know some people that would like have you sign under it with a sharpie and run off and have it inked the next day. You know, so. Uh, you, know. you know, that's that's dedication. Yeah, man, it's easy. I could do that for you. Yeah, you know, I, I, if I had to pick, I don't know, discipline or maybe a lark's tongue. Those look yeah, like they'd be pretty yeah. good. Thanks. That big sun with the face on it. That's Lark's. Yeah, Lark's. yeah, I've seen that a lot. And also the screaming face. But that one looks really good as a tattoo, that big sun with the, yeah. the Lark's. I might do Thrack. You know, that Thrack, the, the, <laughs> the Kimberly Clark logo, however that thing worked. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just a big, a big piece of sheet metal on my arm there. You know? <laughs> well, I mean, it's a tattoo. You maybe just remember flashed on... Uh, when we started it, this Crimson was 2014. Yeah, he called in 2013. We started playing in 2014. And the first gigs were up in Albany at the A. We did some couple shows. Oh, that's started. a neat place. Yeah, it's a great place. And we stayed at a hotel. And if you remember, we were called the Elements. And uh, they get, assigned an element to each one of us. Right. We kind of. It's, was that inspired by Breaking Bad by chance or just a coincidence? Yeah, I don't really know. Uh, David Singleton's son, um, Ben. Ben, I think Ben put that actually. It was, it was a neat idea. He's yeah. very clever. But what's interesting to me is at the hotel, I think it was, which anyway, she pushed a room key or, you know, at the front desk and she had Mo uh, tattooed on her hand. <laughs> no way. How weird is that? Because I'm Mo. Like, why, why are you? The tour starts tomorrow. <laughs> That's wild. You know, I wanted to ask you a bit about the old crimson tunes and i i could just you know the, the one of the cool things you know it's like back in the 90s we we got red we got talking drum and larks number two and that's it did you guys ever consider doing any of the other older stuff back then or was it more about the 80s and exactly. onward you, like, you know like double double trio era um well we did what we did and i can't i can't think of uh yeah we didn't even do schizoid man till the second or third year of that band that's what i thought yeah back now we what happens a lot with crimson consistently is it's difficult to get the band together so usually you wherever the tour starts you come a day or two early and get a couple rehearsal days in and uh so i that's the memory i have is in bordeaux uh france we learned uh waiting man uh, schizoid man and maybe one more man Shel uh, sheltering sky was that in there too yeah, we, we learned that right or, i think right around that that I time so, yeah if the band had continued um i think we would have learned more more material more older material we would have had some really cool uh we we're trying to develop bill and i like um like two djs where you could have uh not both playing drummer not both drummers playing together but have polyrhythms that could overtake one another if that makes any sense sure sort of like a dj when he's crossfading between two things where you can't really figure out where's the downbeat where's the upbeat everything feels and then you're like oh it's just that but uh we thought well we could do some really cool stuff if we'd had another couple of years well I, I really love that era you know i think the first um the first king crimson album i ever owned was um discipline and then when Thrack came out, I remember I was just at Tower Records one day and it was sitting there by the register that I was checking out. I'm like, I'll toss that in there. And I went home and played it and it was like, holy shit, <laughs> this is some heavy stuff. I love it. And But there's some really catchy and beautiful stuff on there too, you know, um, just all kinds of neat stuff. And then um, I got Baboom and I was just like, holy shit, it's like these discipline tunes are on steroids in a really good way. And, and what's this red in Lark's tongue? That's the most exotic music I've ever laid an ear to, you know, at the time. Do you know them? Do 
you heard them first on Baboon? I heard them first there, yeah. And when I went back and heard the originals, I thought they sounded kind of subdued and a little musty, if that makes any sense. <laughs> well, I grew up with those, so those are my classics. But yeah, well, I needed them. I needed them. So, uh, yeah, so I've always had a kind of a sweet spot for Baboon in that whole era. It's great stuff. And then, I, like I told you, I saw the four piece at 12th and Porter when you debuted for Construction of Light. And then uh, again, for Power to Believe. So, yeah, definitely. Once I got on the bus, I was there for keepers. But this new lineup, the most recent one, you know, it's almost like I've said, it's almost like the King Crimson Orchestra in a way. You know, you have this huge sound. It's like anything in the repertoire is is fair game at this point. And I don't think that was probably the case before. You know, you needed to have keyboards and, you know, all the extra stuff to really evoke those sounds from back then. And I was just wondering if you could tell us a bit about playing some of those songs for the first time, like when you guys finally got starless together, was that just, was the hair on your arms just standing straight up? Absolutely. Yeah. Basically, basically every time, Um, you know, I mean, it it wears off a little, but then a day or two later, it's back again. Uh, And I can mention Mexico city was great because uh, after the show, I maybe mentioned to Deb, I said, Wow, my ears are really ringing. The headphones, a lot of feedback tonight. I couldn't take it, man. There's a lot of feedback. And Deborah's, that wasn't feedback, honey. They were singing along. The huh? entire auditorium. Like the, entire auditorium the guitar line. Da, 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 da. All these. Singing like 2,000 people singing the melodies, the guitar lines. And with our in ears here, it's just a blur of. <laughs> sure. Oh, that, yeah, man. That was just glorious. It was just, you know, such a. I was never attached to Islands. That was not a record I really latched onto growing up. No, it was never a favorite of mine either. A good friend of mine said, you know, that's, you know, that's when you sit back in your smoking jacket and a nice glass of brandy and take in once a year. Well, I'm just, I don't play a whole lot in that song. There just isn't an, oh, the song itself rather than the album. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm just going to tell you, man, that's one of the hardest things all night is to sit on stage for five or eight minutes. It's a long song. Um, if I could play something, I could be distracted, but I just, I, it washes over me and it can be really difficult to, uh, he gets you, know, teary is you what get a lump in your throat say. and it's, yeah. you're trying to sit quietly, <laughs> not, not start rubbing tears out, you know, you know what the fuck. It's yeah. Like, you know. It's very difficult actually. Absolutely. So what are some other ones that came together that you're just like, I can't believe we're finally playing this. Well, cat food. Cat food was the first crimson I'd ever heard. I heard it in the library when I was possibly still in grade school, I'm not sure, but, but I heard that before I heard the court. And, uh, and then we talked about jokingly doing it way, even in the projects and things. So, you know, and if you remember in the double duo, uh, Robert would play a lot of tack piano. You yeah. Know, mm-hmm. Got way into the MIDI guitar thing. Well, he always is. But where Adrian would play like a Steinway from his guitar, Adrian mm-hmm. had a big grand piano. Robert was mostly doing like a honky tonk kind of a bar, what I call a tack piano, you know? Yeah, I remember that version of Schizoid Man where he played it, or maybe that was Marimba, one of those. Yeah, yeah, quite, he likes that too, his bells. Yeah. Uh, thinking more like oyster soup. Oh, he, yeah. So, you know, those kind of days, he would go on a long solo. It, be, it it was it was humorous you know it's yeah it's good absolutely yeah. such great stuff um so what musical projects have you got on the horizon for 20 was well hopefully you get back on the road with crimson but what's what's going on well crimson hopes to tour um uh, it was to be um a postponement of last year's tour so the zappa crimson combination Doing this. I think we actually, well, we were starting in Florida. So it was June and July, but now they're, I think they're pushing it back for mm-hmm. July and August. And mm-hmm. uh, so the venues will probably have to change and maybe the double bill changes. So I really can't say. And then when we finish that, um, we hope to do the camp, the three of a perfect pair camp that's in August, if it's, if it's available to do again. I mean, it's available, but if it's safe and, uh, we have a short European stickman tour that's in October. If that happens, I think it's October. And then there's a plan for Crimson to go to Japan, possibly Australia, Japan. And that's November, December ish. So hopefully things have cleared and not, you know, no more deviant strain. Mm-hmm. But the, um, 
in the meantime, I, I stay busy here at home. Uh, He's yeah. never stopped working, really. <laughs> Other people have stopped working. My husband has never stopped working. I st his studio is in the house. So he just goes to work every day. He's got always something to work on. I tell you what, what, what uh, among other things, besides is, uh, is some of the drum pieces that, that were presented last year. And I started to work on some stuff Gavin had sent over. So I pull those back out and start working on them. And uh, are you familiar with Drumio? Do you know what Drumio is? Drumio? No, I don't think so. It's uh, like an online uh, drumming, educational drumming tutorial. Uh, I signed up for Drumio just a few days ago. So I'm taking, I mean, I, it's great. It's great. It's very motivational. I, I really, I'm really enjoying it um, because I can put, uh, you know, some other drummers up and see their routines and try to do them. They're, they're all difficult. I've got a practice pad in every room of the house and definitely try to spend an hour or two a day on the pad and, uh, and, and these simple little foot exercises. Uh, uh, Gil Sharon, if you know the drummer, Gil Sharon has some little slide tech. I mean, it sounds horrible. Uh, if you're around my house right now and working left foot, trying to work on the left foot, you know, so. Um, that'll keep me busy all day. And then there's yard work. <laughs> there's other things to do at home, you know, let's clean the gutters and, uh, and, and do some things that we never have time to do. I'm going to do the, uh, the caulking in the tub here before too long. It needs to be re -caulked. Sounds good. Uh, let me take a peek at the chat room real quick here. Um, so Todd Bernhardt says, thanks, Sean. Just want to say hi to Pat and Deb. You all are, hi, looking, you're looking happy and healthy. Huh. Yeah. We are. Kevin Andrews wants to know what your favorite vocal mic is, Deb, that uh, you felt worked well with your voice. Uh, what'd you use for this record? Anything special? I wasn't even familiar with vocal mics. I mean, I didn't, I, you don't even understand. I was like a fifth grader that was asked to write a master's thesis when Pat <laughs> stuck me in the studio and says, here. When she sang at the camp, she said that's the first time she ever sang on a microphone. Really? In front of an audience, yeah. I when I was younger, I was in acapella groups and modrigals and like corny stuff like that. I never sure. really did that this thing. <laughs> and then once I started, you know, hanging out with Pat, he's so pro. I'm not gonna sing in front of him. I just never did until well, recently. And so he's introducing me to vocal likes. Yeah. And boy, they do make a difference. So what was the one I liked, Mike? Well, the um, mic I liked. Yeah, she likes a U87. There you go, Kevin. Is, uh, there you go. Know. Like I happen to have a, a Neum, you know. A Neum, a U87. So, and that's usually my room mic. So that's another conflict here that I I got her set up originally with an SM7. If you know, big yeah. hat, it's right here behind us right now because we've been using that a lot more for her dialogue. Spoken uh, word works spoken well word with stuff, that. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I bought her. A, I bought an. It, I wanted to be able to set up believe it or not, I expanded. I said, I want to be able to set up two drum kits and my drum machine crap and have everything available anytime. And a vocal mic, by the way, and an extra input for a guitar player. So I want to have like 24 tracks routed and ready to make this record because I put a little kit together with calf skin heads. That's originally how I thought we'd do this record, more, more like a lounge trio. Mm -hmm. It became a bigger thing. But anyway, that's the conflict with my U87. Sometimes it's, I it's have other plans for it. Or it's in his room. And then there's a mic called a copper top. Do you know the copper top? Mm. It's a cheap mic. It's two or $300 mic uh, where the Neumann's a couple, two or 3,000 or more. Uh, but it's sort of a nasally filtered. Uh, I didn't uh, like it. She didn't like it at all. But it's there. I slide it next to each other and record them both and, uh, and squeak a little bit back in. And there might, I think originally, actually, I gave you just an SM57 because you could, I set her up also down in her, um, she's got kind of a little office area because Deb does podcasts. Deb does uh, uh, tarot cards. I don't know if you knew that. She's got a book out. Oh, very uh, nice. Very nice. Hooker, play her that Steve Hackett song called The Ace of Wands. Okay. The kick out of that. There's a tarot related prog song and it's uh, one of his best. It's awesome. Okay. Well, um, yeah, so in her little office studio down there, um, I set you up a little amp and a microphone with the, so she could practice, you know, play a backing track and actually hear herself singing through the mic, through the speaker 
you know, mm -hmm. and start to learn about, oh, that's feedback. Oh, you know, she got really good. She sits right here when I engineer. So she's, we're doing Pro Tools together. And really, you drove in sometimes. I could teach you how to drive. So, well, the visuals, I had, I could understand that. I'm a painter too. So I, I got it the, the way that Pro Tools makes music visual. Mm -hmm. And I could uh, assign colors. I never really use that option called palette on. Yeah. on I, I know we're looking for things, but um, we made the vocals pink. She could find herself <laughs> there. Okay. So we would have some issues sometimes when you're uh, when you're recording multiple takes and they you're you're seeing different colors. And maybe the take you like was green, but once you've rearranged the tracking sheet, that same take is no longer green. It's blue. Mm -hmm. So. It's like, I like that green one. Well, that's not the green one anymore. That's the blue one. So anyway. Uh, it was interesting. It was a learn. The whole thing was like going, it's a master's class. Do you want to do another one? We want to do something. I'm not sure. Uh, we haven't, we can't decide what exactly. I mean, we've been like, like you said, we were playing around with this Lorenzo Felicciati. I really enjoyed that late night DJ thing. I really liked it. I said, God, I could see myself being a late night DJ with that same, you know, voice, that low, sexy voice. That, <laughs> <laughs> that <laughs> and, and Deb writes, uh, writes in the local newspaper. She's, I, she should have books published by now, but I don't know if they've been published. But um, recently, the one about the tree, you know, it, it's a long enough story that she's written. They, they're in the local newspaper um, every month. Every month. I have a column for for years. Oh. She's done the astrology column for the Austin Monthly or Austin Women Magazine. Yeah, different women's magazines. But this one isn't. It's just a she's pulled out of most of those now, right? I mean, most yeah. Now I only do. Uh, I have a anyway. I do a monthly column, but uh, Pat really likes to take those um, columns that I write and then create kind of a word poem and then do them over some drum tracks that he's been working on. Oh. And there's an, it's an interesting... Because there's a story. There's a long story. And uh, it's more fun for me, anyway, to create the music. You know, I can lay some little bed down that we can start to get the story. But then you can start to, yeah, yeah. you know, how, how should the story reveal itself? And what other instrumentation around it or vocal effects, you know? This was fun for me. I, I don't... I don't record that many vocals, you know, in the late nineties, I guess, early, early nineties, late eighties, early nineties, Richard Page asked me to produce a solo record that became his first solo record. I, I ended up turning it over to Kim Bullard and other people finished it. Um, and Peter Kingsbury. So those are the last two singers that I remember putting the mic up and getting love, beating the engineer, you know, it was just the two of us in the studio. And, uh, was quite different with Deborah. <laughs> uh, it's like, honey, you got to keep your position. And if we're going to punch in, know. you know, like we got to fix something, but now we got to do it all again. Cause we really can't get that same sound. You know what I mean? I learned it was better to get three or five quick takes. Um, and then we pick between them, but sometimes it's difficult to get back and get things to drop in like that. But you know, he said, now he said, now you have, Oh, now you have mic chops. Now you know you've been in a, you've done a record and you've been in a studio and now you've got your chops. But I didn't when we started. I had no chops. None. Well, it's quite a learning experience. But boy, the fruits of your labor have paid off. I think because you what the album is really really awesome. Yeah. Uh, let me take another peek in the chat room real quick here. Bill Brinkmuller says hello to Hi, Bill. And Pat. Hey, Bill. Okay, let's see who else is in here. Uh, <laughs> did you collaborate with Stephen Wilson on any of the XTC mixing he did? No. It was all him on his own. Christine Anz gives you her best. Hi, Christine. Can't wait to see the two of you performing together. Where? What? <laughs> <laughs> This camera on. <laughs> can you see Where's yourselves? That? Can you see yourselves doing a weekly show like Toya and Robert do? Not like that. <laughs> I could never get my husband in a bee costume and dancing around our backyard like that. Will never happen in our lifetimes. Just so you know. 
So if we did, it wouldn't be anything like what they're doing. They're just what they, they're above and beyond creativity, what they've got going on up there. Well, they're having a lot of fun. And I think it's showing a, a different side to Robert. You know, he's, he's always had a good sense of humor, though, hasn't he? If you just know him well. Yeah. Well, also, Toya is such a big personality. Her voice is big and she's got a lot of energy. I, I'm a big Toya fan, by the way. I just I just love that woman. And so what they've got, you know, is just that's uniquely them. And that's what makes it so entertaining. Like, I, I, Pat and I would have to be, see something totally different. Yeah. I'm not sure how we, how we would do a good job of it. So. <laughs> something totally different then. Oh, I meant to ask, um, if, real quick before we wrap it up, um, Construction of Light, it was reissued. You um, went in and put real drums on it. And I was just curious. I've heard rumors that the original tapes were lost. I heard other rumors that you just wanted to try something different. Um, what's the story on that? I wanted to try something different and the tapes were lost. So it was a good oh, opportunity. Yeah, good timing to lose them. <laughs> um, you know, doing the record was in Adrian's house on electronic drums. And I did want to incorporate some acoustic drums. It, it just didn't happen. It wasn't the right time to do that. Well, I was wondering what inspired the all electronic approach early on. Well, it was the V drums. And it was that Robert, uh, you know, if you think to the projects a few years before that, um, he, he was at, uh, uh, Adrian was at, sorry, Robert was at Adrian's house when Adrian's V drums were delivered. Uh -huh. So Adrian pulls them out of the case and starts to play him. And Robert hears, Hey, you can put a bass line in the bass drum and, and, and hit notes and play you can be a drummer so adrian let's go on tour so that was project two yeah i think it too yeah damn space so, groove and, and robert was completely over the moon about these v drums it was like he had a very good point he said when you see a band and you see a drummer up there hitting a cymbal or a hi-hat you never hear it you don't know what it is he says these drums are like magic everything is precise in the pa i can hear every detail of the of, of the nuances of the instrument you know if you're sitting behind the drum kit it's a different feeling sure but he's right when you're out front that shit's pretty spectacular it's beefy and you know so that was the direction he wanted to go and uh my compromise to myself and also we had done project three and i'm pretty good with beatboxes and different variations of what i call a beatbox whether it's in the computer or or a lindrum or a, you know a tribe or whatever, all these different beatboxes on the XTC record. It was a Korg, by the way. Andy Partridge had a little Korg. So besides what I did on the Lindrum LM2 and the Lind 9000 and an RX5 Yamaha, which is the end of Hello, uh, Hold Me, My Daddy, a very African sounding little cheap beatbox. Uh -huh. And then I got this. So anyway, I'm good with beatboxes. And when we did Project 3, I used a lot of beatboxes. Um, so it just, those nuances developed where, where Robert wanted to go in that direction. And, um, and that's what we did. But I was always, there's a little bit on the Project X record, Heaven and Earth. I used some Taustrums, those big, we set up a acoustic kit in Adrian's garage. Um, so I did do some, a little bit, but it never really got much on the record. So. And he and never was a hundred percent happy with that. It's always been a little thing that he could, you know that performance that he wanted to add some acoustic he's always wanted to it would just be more visceral with real drums and when we got out and toured if you remember we toured one tour starting in europe with just electronic stuff and then by the end of that tour um it was in uh it was in i remember it vividly if i can think of it, it was barcelona when we had dinner and robert said uh he might want to bring some acoustic drums back in. So it's like, yes, okay. Oh, I bet. Were there nights where you were just sitting there playing that electric kit going, damn it, I wish I had my real drums? Um, a little bit. The worst thing, one of the most uncomfortable things about that live, playing the V drums on, with Crimson live, is how quiet we were. Because that was, that was another appealing thing about the V drums working up the material at Adrian's house where we recorded it, we could all be in the room together at very low volume. We didn't have to wear headphones. The guys could play through small amps, drums were turned down, but sounded big. So once we got on stage, it actually did the same thing. It became so quiet, the monitoring, believe it or not, that you could hear the pads, you know, the, the drums weren't, the pads were as loud as the drums. When Bill was my tech then, Bill could, we could have a conversation 
We didn't have to yell. We could be playing the red and I could be talking this level and playing red on V drums. And I can, the stage is very quiet. <laughs> so uh, there's a lot of appealing things about it, but it also there's no power. There's no balls to this thing. So I was say just playing that quiet, I think would affect the performance on some level, you know, it, it affects the attitude and, and, yeah. and I broke pads. I was still trying to, I was trying to get more out of them than they would ever give. So. Was it dependable or were there times when it gave you trouble tech glitchy uh, wise? Well, the rig got pretty big, but it was very consistent. I actually went into that Roland mixer. There was a V a Roland virtual mixer, 48 channels or more because I had to sub mix things down. So I wasn't just using the V drums. I was using a wave drum. I was using some beat boxes. I was using the D drum where I could put my own samples. The V drum is just the, the sounds that come in it. Right. I take my own samples, stuff from Curie Laison. I use those sounds oh, still nice. sometimes, or old Mister Mister stuff like that. Mm -hmm. We've got big studio sounds. I still have them in my library, or Arabic sounds, or whatever it is. So, um, I forget the question. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyhow, um, tell me about Pompeii. That must have been so cool to play there. I mean, first people that played there since. Pink Floyd, you know, in the early seventies. And then David Gilmore, I think came back with his band a few months before you guys were there. I and got to go. Yeah, were, I was there. We loved Pompeii. We liked the city too. Oh, I we could imagine. Staying in Naples and we stayed in Naples like one night. And then we came down to Pompeii and did the tour and we loved the little place we were in. And we just stayed in Pompeii. We didn't go back with the band. Huh? Mm -hmm. We, we didn't go back to Naples. The band hotel was in Naples, which is an hour or more, maybe a couple hours, excuse me. And um, I can't, did we play two nights? Why would we have stayed over? I'm trying to figure that out. I think we only played one night. Just, but then after the show, when everybody got on the bus to go back to the hotel in Naples, we said, we'll stay here at the, at the backstage <laughs> so we can wake up and see Naples. Yeah, was, yeah. Uh, Pompeii, okay. I'm sorry. And it's something to see. So we had the morning really hot, even 8 a.m. or yeah, whenever we got yeah. up, baking hot. Yeah. Uh, and then the gig was, that's a magic gig, man. I mean, that's a special They place. have a photo that I think is in the album where they walk through the... The, the gladiators. The gla the, where the gladiators walk through to get to the arena. And they've got the guys standing there and they shot a picture of it. And... Pat's always been a big fan of like Spartacus, so the whole idea of going into the arena, but here he was doing it. Yeah, it was it was intense and profound. I can imagine it would really be. Really energetic audience, <laughs> yeah. really energetic audience. And am I right? They were just on the floor. They didn't get to sit in the seating because that's kind of half overgrown at this point. Yeah. Well, it wasn't a floor. It was gravel. Just gravel? Okay. And folding chairs. Folding chairs out there. Were there people up around? I, don't, I mean, there were people up above. Because, uh, you know, the arena goes up and, and people could be seated up here, even if there wasn't seating. Uh, and, I don't know, okay, kind of around the edge. They actually kind of rushed the stage towards the end of that gig because I, I remember a, kind of a fight broke out right yeah. in front of me. It was a real bummer because, <laughs> <laughs> because I knew a couple of the guys were, were, were had flown from America or Europe. So I, I, they'd come to that gig special and uh, they spotted people with cameras and did the uh, hey, hey, knock it off. And, and they uh, didn't want to. Yeah. They didn't want to knock it off. <laughs> uh, it's like, get out of my way. I'm going to take every picture I want. What's another place you really remember playing that was just amazing? Monaco. Monaco? Oh, tell me more. Monaco. Well, it's, I'd have to show you a picture. It's, I don't know who made that. I, Garnier. I, uh, so Garnier did this beautiful opera house in Paris, right? So this is a miniature of that, but it's up on top of a cliff right next to that famous James Bond casino in Monaco. Right. So it's right there. And I did my research. I, I knew this was going to be a stunning place, but we entered from the bottom. So you go in through the bottom, they take you in through the back. There's a the green room and no, we didn't even get to the green room. So we're in the little rehearsal rooms. There's there are giant grand pianos in all the rehearsal rooms. And um, so they never really saw the stage until they went up to set up their equipment. And you can sit in the audience and watch the guys. And there are just paintings and sculptures all over the inside of this opera house. 
And so if the guys aren't playing, they're doing this. <laughs> because the chandeliers and the detail and the you balconies just, and and it's i mean that place is spectacular and, and just gold everywhere gold everywhere um, <laughs> giant mirrors with gold leaf everywhere but and so many of the places the venues crimson place are gorgeous uh, like that uh, unbelievable the, would you say your venues have improved with this incarnation compared to where you were playing in the 2000s well that's true we played a lot of bars then didn't we yeah. Well, I remember several testy diaries from Robert going, venue was unacceptable. Yeah. <laughs> so, right, though, Robert is very much a stickler about the way the sound. And if he can't control the sound, it really, he doesn't enjoy it at all. I don't blame him. No, and but you know how bands sometimes you can't control the sound, but Robert is on top of it. He's a genius in that way. And so he loves playing theaters. That to him to have the audience sitting and you can control the sound and you've got these big ceilings and, and outside is usually best you know outside that you can control the sound more mm -hmm. dealing with the reflection it doesn't bounce off the walls the same way yeah um so i wanted to ask you about is there any tune from crimson's past that you really want the guys to dust off that you haven't gotten to yet well I love Great Deceiver. I've been a fan of that. I've been oh, yeah. Hickman could do it for we years. We almost so. did it. We tried to do it for this record, actually. I couldn't make the lyrics work for myself, but I'm, I've still got it in the back of my mind. I yeah, those lyrics are a little unique, you know. It's... Yeah, and I, how can I, you know? So we didn't ended up not doing it, but we it was on our list. Yeah, that, that's a song I, I love that one. Yeah, I, don't I, saw, I saw them a crimson in '73 or '4 twice. Um, uh, first, I saw them in San Francisco. I was living in East Bay, and they played the Cow Palace, opening for ten years after. So they played a short set, and then um, uh, my band was breaking up, and I opened up a Rolling Stone magazine, and I saw Crimson's playing in about a week down in Los Angeles at the Shrine uh, with the Schraubs, and they're the head headliner down at the LA gig I knew they'd do a longer show and since my East Bay band was kind of all fizzling apart anyway I said you know I think I'm gonna leave <laughs> <laughs> that's when I moved to LA uh, packed up my lamp and my drum kit and uh, toothbrush <laughs> whatever I would have had in those days into a U-Haul and drove down and and uh, that's when I got to see Todd that same week with the ping pong balls I think we just talked mm -hmm. about that uh, I saw Gentle Giant at the Whiskey. Oh. They did uh, a Glass House and Surround Sound. Wow. I saw Return to Forever doing Romantic Warrior at the Troubadour. And I was the front seat. <laughs> with, uh, the opening act for Return to Forever was Scatman Crothers. And it was a bit of a ukulele kind of routine. And he. Wow. he he spit while he talked and he, <laughs> spit, and he covered me and uh, I was cleaning it up. So I became a sort of like a Don Rickles. He's singer. more like spat man. <laughs> yes. But anyway, I became the butt of every joke for the rest of his routine is a little boy here. Can't take a little water. It was like, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I saw uh, Crimson is amazing. And Mahavishnu even I, I Anyway, that was a fantastic gig, and I think they started with Great Deceiver. And I should share with you my Mahavishnu story if you want. Yeah, please do. As a matter of fact, I've got Jerry Goodman on next month. So, uh, okay. Yeah, lay it on me. This was an amazing couple of weeks. The first few weeks I moved to Los Angeles. Um, and um, I had been busted for drugs and had some other issues. So I was meeting my mother was to, to go through, you know, I was, I was about 18, I guess. And um, she, she wanted a mother, you know, well, there was a long talk. She wanted to have a long talk. So we went to a restaurant on Sunset called uh, The Source, which was sort of a health food. My mom was into health food before anybody ever knew. She Everything back in the 70s was organic and veggie. Um, so we're having this intense discussion at lunch there with our alfalfa sprouts. And she looks over and she says, there's that guy. I said, what? what? And I look over, it's John McLaughlin. She recognized this is a white garb. Is this that veggie restaurant across from the Hyatt House down on West it's Hollywood? In La Cienega and Sunset. So mm -hmm. not across from, from, from uh, the Riot House, but just down the street. Just Very down the street. Yeah, there's a famous picture of Steve Howe standing next to a Tales from Topographic Oceans billboard. Could be. Right by the health food restaurant. 
Yes, yeah. and uh, also uh, Tower Records right in that same. Street. Yeah, yeah, right down the way. Yeah. But anyway, my mom says, "Go, go, go, talk to him." Go, and I'm like, "Mom, I'm not going to go talk to John McLaughlin." And so she does. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh god, no, you no, have no, to no, know no, his no. mother too. It's yeah, so yeah. perfect. My son is a big fan of yours. Come talk to him. Like That's that. exactly that Just because like then that. John's going, "Come here." <laughs> And he says, your mom says you're a big fan of the band. I said, yeah, big, big fan of the band. She said, uh, you were coming down to see us last night. We played, I said, yeah, you played in Long Beach, but I didn't know, I've just come to LA. I didn't know where Long Beach was and I left too late. The traffic, it was like nine o'clock and I was on the 405 and I didn't think I'd get there. So I turned around and went home. And he said, well, we're playing again tomorrow. I said, where, where are you playing? Uh, I don't see anything in the newspaper. He says, no, no, it's kind of a private show. It just the place just up the street that just opened. Uh, he said, it's the Roxy. Said, the Roxy. I, that, that, yeah, I've heard of that. It's all over in the Rolling Stone magazine this week, you know? And he says, well, if you want to come to the show, I'll leave you tickets. Come to the uh, backstage door. Yeah. And uh, I said, I don't, I don't know what you mean. Come backstage or whatever he said to go to Wilk, whatever he said, I didn't even know. I'd never, and um, I didn't know, I didn't have a date. He left me two tickets all by myself. But again, I had the front seat and um, and uh, that was very close to the end of the band because he had told me at the restaurant, he says, this will be one of our last shows. The band is breaking up. Uh, and, and they'd already recorded the uh, live in New York record. Because I remember he told me, give me your address and I'll send you a copy of the record, which I never got. Was that a, <laughs> between nothingness and eternity, I think is what that wound up being. Yeah. Um, and this yeah. was the original lineup, right? The one yeah, with yeah, Non yeah. Hammer and Absolutely. Absolutely. The, yeah. the original five guys. And actually the opening act was was a real treat. It was the section, which is Lee Sklar and Russ Kunkel. Oh and wow. Andy Kuchmer and Greg. I can't pronounce his name, but I had no idea. These were the guys playing with Jackson and, and, and Jackson Brown and, you know, all these, they play fusion. These guys really tore it up. They were, they were like, I had no idea that Russ Kunkel could. Yes. There you go. Yeah. Russ Good is a great, great drummer. Much, much. I only saw that one side of him until that one gig where he is. In fact, he broke his bass. He played double bass. If you think of that. Uh, Russ Kunkel on double bass and he broke his right pedal during the show because I was so close I could see exactly oh, what. and he had to play side saddle and a lot of left foot stuff to get through a song or two so oh, wow. it was great. Well, those are some amazing memories wow you know and then and then you wind up in King Crimson they're like your favorite band right I mean life is weird man dreams can come true it can happen to you if you're young at heart that's right <laughs> Well, is there anything you two would like to share before we wrap it up? Mm -hmm. Okay, remind them one more time where to get the album, <laughs> A Romantic's Guide to King Crimson. Yeah, you get that record from uh, 7D Media, uh, and it, it'll be Bandcamp and all that kind of stuff. We'll start okay. putting that out in a few weeks. Or so like the letter seven, and I mean the number seven and the letter D. Yeah, yeah, I have pretty good luck. If I just type in Romantic, 7d it seems to take me there so you can pre-order the thing and uh and then a cd will be in the mail i guess and we're just starting to mail them out ourselves we've got them now i go to the post office 7 a.m couldn't afford the full-on uh promo campaign so so you're not doing the special deluxe coffee table box set with a a, a limb of that. your choice included yeah. but i yeah. want a, i want she a wants vinyl. vinyl i do and I've been telling her how expensive, how complicated. Now she's busted me. She's seen it's not that expensive or complicated. There's a website over here. <laughs> so, this is true. Well, you can at least order a couple for the house if nothing else, you know. <laughs> Do you listen to much vinyl around the house? Oh, yeah. We <laughs> Pretty much that's your preferred format. Every record he's ever bought since he was 16 years old. A lot of them, but uh, yeah, we have, a, I don't know how many, but plenty of yeah. records. What was I going to say was uh, that uh, Deb's made a, a really interesting, uh, I wouldn't call it a postcard. What would you call that? A placard? A, uh, anyway, her inter her impressions of some King Crimson music and things like that, uh, particularly these songs. So there's a couple goodies like that that we've been sticking in for the promo people. Okay. So eventually we'll have to uh, put it on a record. 
Yeah, yeah. I had a, we got a couple other ideas we're cooking with. Uh, but the next thing will be Friday for Pat Mascalato band camp. Uh, and soon there will be a Deborah Carter band camp. We're working on that. It's all behind the scenes. It's almost done. We'll just we'll launch it in a week or so and um, present some other material that Deborah does, as well as her book and stuff like that can be there. Have you considered maybe doing a live stream where you do a couple of the Crimson songs from the record, maybe even with some backing tracks? Uh, well, that would be doable. It would be complicated to organize. But as soon as you put up a backing track, then, yeah, we could play along and sing along with it. Uh, it's how to present that. I don't sure. know. Sure. I think, I think people would enjoy it if it happened. So just, just you know, an idea. When I did that thing for the Percussive Arts Society, I got three GoPros and I thought that I just knocked this thing out in a weekend. It takes forever to get things properly recorded and put in and put together. Yeah, and then the editing is, yeah. yeah. Dude, I, I was, I, the thing had to go to Pasig on Friday and we were Thursday still trying to learn reading the manual for uh, <laughs> what is this what is this other thing i got premiere premiere something yeah yeah, my computer yeah but it's really good yeah yeah all righty well i guess i better wrap it up but thank you so much for taking the time out of your evening to hang out with me and talk about the new record um, wait a minute you have a copy of it I, well, I do. Yeah, I have a mask. Yeah, yeah, I have a copy of that. Okay, we're gonna hold it up. Yeah, and then if yeah, you yeah. Can, next oh, Friday at that band. Yeah. A little, little closer. The glare is bad. There you go. That's good. That's good. Get it together. Yeah. Well, higher, uh, higher, higher. Here, you work on that. I'll work on this other thing. I got another plan. You do that. Get there we go. Yes. I think. Uh, give me Am just one. It? There you go. That looks good. Okay. Let's see if I can make this happen before he's off. Let's see if I do. One second. One second. <laughs> oh, that's oh, nice. Da -da -da. <laughs> hey, it's a bouquet behind it's not it. It's not a record. Wait a second. Go no, on. it's not. Yeah. It's my postcard. Okay, let me get the right one up there. How do we do this again? Virtual background. Uh, yeah, there we go. There we go. That's it. Da -da -da. Oh, it's too low. Well, anyway, that sort of. It looks like that. Is. Okay. Yeah, it's beautiful. Very yeah. nice. Yes. Oh, we can. That's pretty weird. Yeah, they, that's kind of, that's why I don't usually use it because I just my arm vanishes all of a sudden. It does the screen screen? Yeah, that's what she said. I had prepped this up before, and Deb said, "Don't do that." Okay. It gets a little weird sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> I can't get rid of it. Sorry. Okay, dude. All right, Bye. Pat, Deborah, thank you so much. Stay safe. Everybody, check out the album, and I'll be back Bye. Saturday. Night. I'll be back Saturday night with session bassist Adam Nitty. Oh, okay. yay. I think he's there in Nashville too, if I'm not mistaken. So y'all take care. Have a good week. Bye. Uh, come back anytime.